we're going to get started with our webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on our call today. My name is Nicole Van Wert Quincy from TransCAT, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. Our webinar topic is Maximize Safety and Reliability with the Only Wired Heart Level Detector. It's being presented by Kevin Thomas from Emerson. Kevin is a process level instrumentation expert. He collaborates with engineers to solve challenging level measurement and monitoring situations across many industries, including refining, chemical, life sciences, food and beverage, pulp and paper, power, metals and mining, and oil and gas. He lives in Minneapolis and enjoys spending time outdoors with family and friends and is a motorsports enthusiast, um, including boating, snowmobiling, and motorcycling. Unfortunately, he can probably still snowmobile in his area of the world, and I could as of a couple weeks ago in upstate New York. Um, <laughs> we expect the presentation today to last roughly 30 minutes, and we will answer any questions that have been submitted. During any time of the presentation, you can send questions through the question box to the right in your webinar controls. I also want to mention that the webinar is being recorded. You will each receive a follow-up email with a link to the recorded webinar and the slides of today's presentation. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kevin. Okay, very good. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, as Nicole said, my name is Kevin Thomas, and I am a process level product manager with Emerson. I will do, be doing today's presentation on the Rosemount 2140 wired heart level detector. As part of today's agenda, we're going to go through the following agenda items. First of all, we will talk about the importance of point level detection. Many uh, customers and many facilities use continuous level measurements, and there is a need for point level detection uh, in conjunction with those continuous measurements. We will also be talking about the next generation of point level detection. Again, this is the Rosemount 2140. We will be going through some applications for the 2140, and I have a few specification slides to show for you. And then we'll, lastly, we'll show you how to order the 2140. So to go ahead and get started today, we're gonna get on with the importance of point level detection. So we get this question a lot. Why do you need point level detection with liquids and solids and sediments? One of the first things we talk about with point level detection is preventing overfills and preventing spills in your work area. And in some cases, some of these overfills could result in filling of hazardous chemicals spilling on the floor, creating a safety incident or a safety unsafe workspace for your, your workers. Uh, the other thing we look at too is improving efficiency of your plant operations. The plant operational efficiency is very important and that includes having enough product and tanks to support downstream requirements, as well as, again, preventing spills and overfills that would require cleanup time. Last but not least is preventing damage to your equipment. Now, damage could happen, again, from corrosive applications or overpressurization, overfilling, any other case where a high-level alarm would cause an upset condition for your process. Some of the challenges that have been experienced by point level legacy products has been some unreliability with overfill prevention solutions. So some of that means is, again, creating an unsafe, potentially unsafe workspace for your workers. And for us, this is key. This is number one is always safety, making sure that our workers are safe and able to come back into work the next day and the day after and the week after. Um, so bottom line, that's the most important. We need a device that we can trust the measurement accuracy, and not only in simple applications, but in very challenging applications as well. So that for us, that includes low density applications or quick process level changes. Some of the other issues with legacy point level devices has been lack of insight into the device health. So that means knowing the device is operational, even after potentially one, two, three years, of being at the top of a vessel and not, never seeing an overfill condition. How do we know that that device is ready to operate and is willing and able to create that false trip or an actual trip? The risk of measuring low density fluids is also a concern because it does take more coverage of the forks on the vibrating fork switch in order to cause it to go from dry to wet. 
There's also the risk of nuisance alarms from splashing or turbulence, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here coming up. Another challenge with point level detection on legacy products has been the inability to measure sand or sediment detection at the bottom of a vessel underneath a liquid. So there's a lot of different products in the market that can measure solids. There's a lot of different products in the market that can measure liquids, but there is not really a product that measures solids building up within a vessel. And we've seen this need across all industries where we need to measure the sediment at the bottom of a vessel building up over time. So when we can measure this, we can actually reduce the risk of plugged flow lines, unplanned shutdowns and damage to equipment in avoiding costly shutdowns. So just a quick evolution of where point level started. Point level really actually started with what looks to be like a toilet bowl float ball cock. You can see that on the very left, very simple valve operated with a float. And as we progress through time, you can see how it evolved into more digital and more electronic measurement types, including capacitance types probes ultrasonic gap switches, and then around 1980, the vibrating fork switches with basic digital input outputs. In about the 2010 timeframe, we released a wireless heart level detector referred to as the Rosemount 2160. So we've had a heart device in our portfolio now for about eight years. And uh, we've had a lot of requests for moving into a wired product to gain that ultimate reliability of a wired product, quick acting and uh, advanced diagnostics health built in as well. So if we look forward into the future now, and we take a look at our newest product, we're looking at the Rosemount 2140 level detector and the Rosemont 2140 SIS level detector. And again, these are the world's first heart level detectors. And you'll notice the distinction I'm making with saying detector rather than switch. These devices are now fully heart. And this device here can be put on a loop similar to a 3051S pressure transmitter or any other loop powered device. These are fully registered heart devices, heart five and eight, heart seven compatible hosts. And again, we have this digital infrastructure to wire our products back into your plant infrastructure. What this means for us is taking the analog devices of the past, the legacy devices, and converting them to the new digital infrastructure that allows feedback, advanced diagnostics, health status, and a lot of other information stored in the device to now be transmitted to the control room. So the most important device in your overfill prevention now has feedback to the control room. Where in the past, the most important device typically didn't have any feedback to your control room. We relied on a product that we know was intended to work, but we didn't have that indication that it was working. So introduced in the 2140, we designed the 2140 around three key pillars. For us, that's reliability, ease of use, and safety. So with three keys, these three key, key pillars in mind, we'll go through the three different pillars here and talk about how each one applies to the Rosemount 2140. So starting with reliability. When we designed the Rosemount 2140, we developed this product based around existing technology that we had in the Rosemount portfolio. So we, we utilized the existing fast strip fork design that we have on our Rosemount 2120s and 2130 product lines. And we also used the infrastructure and the digital side from the Rosemount pressure transmitter portfolio. So combining these two technologies together, we can offer point level detection with a very high reliability with products that have been tried, true, and tested in the marketplace and tested at your most challenging applications. What that means for you is rapid switching in visky or viscous or sticky applications. That means consistent switch points, regardless of what product the switch is inserted into, and no calibration. 
really these devices are calibration free. Once you install them, they're intended to operate for the life of the product and they will operate for several, several years. Even if they haven't been used in those several years, they'll still operate and they'll still give you that health feedback back to the control room. You'll see we designed this around the Rosemount dual compartment housing. And this again is based on the pressure transmitter line here. What this does for us is separates the electronics from the terminal block. And that means for us is, and means for you, is the reliability of having the sensitive electronics of this digital device separated from the area that a technician may be wiring this into the process. And again, we're totally sealing off the electronics for us. So getting back to how do you know your point level detector will work when it's needed? Again, think about the case where you have perhaps a radar unit installed and it operates for three years without any problem. And all of a sudden after three years, something happens with the radar unit. Maybe it's getting coated, maybe it's getting corroded from the process and it loses track of the surface. We have a point level switch or a point level detector at the top, but how do we know after three years that the health of the device and the status of the device is ready to detect that overfill condition? Well, the Rosemont 2140 has diagnostics built in to continuously monitor that health status, including the electronics, as well as the mechanical side of the device. So if anything happens with the device, we will get a fault detected and the operator will be alerted and we could force the status of the switch to change from off to on or from on to off. So causing the control room to go out and take a look at the situation. The 2140 does do an internal function check and it does this uh, continuously. We're always looking for internal wire disconnects, breaks in the process, uh, issues with the electronics, or maybe even just an LCD failure. We can also look at the fork corrosion or fork damage based on the frequency of the device as well. So we can monitor over time what that fork is doing and the vibration of the fork to discern if there's any issues with the process. The big benefit to all this frequency monitoring is to understand and to be detecting conditions before they become a problem. So with the smart diagnostics package that's built into all 2140s, we are doing frequency profiling. So a good example of that is on the left-hand side of your screen, we're actually looking at the frequency of vibration and we're watching that over time. And we're making sure that that signal looks like an actual expected real signal. We can detect emerging conditions such as buildup or fork corrosion. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slide. Secondly, we have the power advisory diagnostic feature. So again, this is also an important feature. The switch or the level detector that's installed needs to always have adequate power in order to function. So the Rosemont 2140 level detector now has this power advisory alert built in. So again, we're checking all the different aspects that may contribute to a failure and we're detecting for those aspects. And when we do detect those, we can create a process alert. So a user or an operator does go out and check on the device long before any instance of an overfill condition may occur. So again, we talk about the 2140 as being more than a switch. Again, this is a level detector. This device is a fully heart device powered by loop powered wires. And what we're showing you on the screen is your standard landing page in the dig digital infrastructure here. You'll see a few key things pointed out. Sensor frequency. Now the standard frequency is nominally 1400 Hertz. So you can see in the photo here, this one is 1381.3. We also have the electronics temperature and we're recording the highest temperature experienced. And this also helps us ensure that the electronics did not go over temperature, which may contribute to a low reliability. <clears throat> we look at percent of range as well as analog output. 
So not only do we get a sensor state, which you see in the middle of your screen as dry, we can also map some frequency ranges to the 4 to 20 milliamp analog output. So we'll talk a little bit about that in an upcoming slide, how you can utilize the analog output even if you don't have a digital system. In terms of reliability, the 2140 is designed to be used ready out of the box. The default setting will be 8 to 16 milliamps, and it will be set for the standard specific gravity range that you see on your screen. When we talk about So this allows you to get more response from the device, and again, brings back the responsiveness in very high or Next, I want to talk about ease of use of the 2140. So with the ease of use messaging here, we're looking at accessing smart diagnostics and being able to test the device remotely and being able to get that health diagnostics. Again, this is all about safety here, not climbing the tanks, not having an operator climb up to the vessel on the top, um, checking out the different settings and making pulling the transmitter out of the process and actually testing it in a bucket of water. This keeps workers out of the hazardous areas. This greatly reduces the routine inspections and tests that you need to do and really helps to bring the operator in control of the reliability of the network of level devices. When we talk about proof testing, for, well, for us, what this means is operating on the scale of input, processing, and output. Now, you can see the little graphic at the top of the screen. We have a process fluid that's going to get wet in the material. And then the tuning fork and the sensor actually changes frequency. That frequency is picked up by the device itself. And we take that frequency band and we use that information to convert to an output, a discrete output, either eight to 16 milliamps, or we could even do continuous mapping of that frequency range. Again, this is back to saving space in the control panel, fully integrated capability with no extra wirings point to point. And you can really do all this active heart command straight from the control room, including testing. Remote proof testing can either be done from the LCD display it can be done through the push button on the top of the device in a hazardous area or straight digitally from the control room. So this partial proof test checks the processing and output stages. We're checking for the digital infrastructure. We're checking for the electronics robustness. We actually cycle through high and low level alarms. And then we return the device to normal operation mode immediately following the test procedure. So next, I'll just show a quick video. There's no sound in this video, but we'll play this here, and it kind of describes the remote partial proof test of the room 2140. So as you can see, there's a push button under the top cover. And, and again, this is a magnetic push button, so it can be done in a hazardous area. The other method is to use the proof test button on the software. And what we do is we put the device through a standard process of going from low, so 
So this would be the dry condition to the high, which is the wet condition, eight and 16 milliamps. And last but not least, we'll go to the alarm condition. So what we're testing here is the ability of the power supply to provide eight milliamps, six milliamps, I'm sorry, eight milliamps, 16 milliamps, and then the high alarm current value. This allows us to know that the power supply is capable, and if it did go into an alarm mode, we would be able to have the power to supply the device. So again, this goes back to eliminating the risk of the Rosemont 2140 being accidentally left in test mode. It returns back to its original state immediately after the test, and then we've proven that the device is operating properly. All right, in terms of ease of use, I talked a little bit about this on a previous slide. We have a media learn function built into the Rosemount 2140. What this does is, I mentioned we have the four different specific gravity categories that you could be loaded into. You can go into the low, the middle low, the standard, and then the high category. And in terms of media learn, what it does is you could dip a fork into an unknown liquid and hit the media learn button, and it will fine tune that fork switch that, or that level detector to that specific gravity fluid. Now on the left hand side at the very bottom, you can see how a specific gravity, a high specific gravity would typically only require the tips of the forks to be covered in order to switch because it's such a dense and heavy fluid. On a low specific gravity, you'd have to cover the, the majority or all of the fork switch in order for it to switch because it's a lighter fluid. Now using media learn or changing the specific gravity density settings, we can bring that switch point back to the middle of the fork. And again, this allows us to fine tune the device to be most appropriately matched with the specific gravity of the fluid that it's performing in. Now again, the standard setting is 0.8 to 1.3 specific gravity out of the box. So many times you won't need to change this, but if you do run into a case like we show on the left-hand side, where you want to maximize the reliability and the effectiveness of the switch, you may want to use this media learn function. In terms of ease of use, we have another function built into the device. The Rosemont 2140 can detect if sand or sediment is building up at the bottom of a vessel. So this is an interesting topic here where we have fluid within a vessel and we actually have sand or sediment building up underneath that liquid at the bottom of the vessel. So we developed a sand detection functionality to go in there into the tank, mount it at the bottom, and actually detect when that sediment builds up. So we're essentially ignoring the liquid part of the vessel. And we're looking for just the solid buildup at the bottom. All right, last but not least, I wanna talk about safety and how that applies to the Rosemont 2140. We have two different products. We have the Rosemont 2140 standard product for your basic process control systems. And on the right hand side, you'll see the Rosemont 2140 SIS. So on the SIS, this is the fully safety instrumented SIL2 level switch. And we have third party documentation testing to verify all the different calibrations and all the different data that goes with a SIL2 device. And I'll show a good graph coming up here that helps explain that a little bit more. So in terms of the 2140 SIS, this device here is based again on the existing infrastructure of the 2100 series legacy products, as well as the robustness of the 3051 pressure product transmitter line. When we did the third party testing, the actual probability is less than one dangerous failure in 8,000 years based on the statistical analysis. 
So I'll show you uh, how that plays out in terms of a process and doing proof testing over time. When we take a look at safety failure fractions here, we take a look at numbers that are as high as 97.7%. Again, if you are a SIL expert and you pay attention to these numbers, you'll know that 97.7 is a very high number, very respectable number. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see another key item highlighted in blue, very low dangerous undetected failure rate. So another key statistic of SIS instrumentation is dangerous undetected failure rates. And the Rosemont 2140 has a rate of 13, which is a very, very good rate for the FIT number. So we put this in a little bit into perspective of what, this, what all these good numbers mean over time. When we take a look at the probability of failure on demand, which is another key statistic used in SIS transmitters, we look at the SIL2 level. That's represented by the top orange line on this graph. So if you take a look at that line, 0 0.01. Now at the bottom, we are showing four different, three different lines for the Rosemont 2140. The very green line in the bottom there is if you do an annual proof test of the device. Again, this is the electronic test. The orange line right above it is if you did no proof testing. And same with the blue line above it as well. Again, no proof test. And you can see how far below these test lines are from the SIL2 rating. So again, lower is better. These are probabilities of failing when the device is required to operate. That's what probability of failure on demand means. All right, in terms of safety, we also have protections against being able to change the device. Once we get it locked in and we have the device programmed as we intended, we can lock the device so then there's no unauthorized access. No changes can be made. We do that a few different ways. We have the local hardware switch, which is actually, which is actually in the device itself. And then we also have a user selectable password. So we can have a four digit pin put in there as well. And last but not least, you can go into the right protect mode from the software itself. So multiple different ways that we can control access to the device. So this allows no external modification to any configurations, and this allows you to have the safest possible scenario for your level devices. So again, think about a device that's installed for three years. You want that confidence that over three years, nobody has gone in there and made changes or setting changes or configuration settings to the device. All right, next I wanna cover some applications. And again, these are generic photos here, but I do wanna cover some of the key use items for the Rosemount switch product line and level detector product line. So the key benefit here is for overfill prevention and automated overfill prevention systems. Again, we don't want an overfill a tank. The other ones we take a look at are high and low level alarms. So you could use this at the bottom of a vessel as well as a top and control a liquid between two different points. We could also do monitoring and control. And you can see how we can do run dry protection. The third picture over from the left shows how we are pre preventing a potential run dry case. If the tank ever went empty and the pump downstream ran dry, there could be damage to product. And last but not least, sand and sediment detection for the 2140. All right, this is our specification slide. I just wanna show you a couple different features on this specification here. Many of the tests that we talked about and the detections and this media learn functionality uh, fall under this standard product, the Rosemont 2140. So we have the local proof testing, we have remote partial proof testing, we also have sand detection, media learn, and the smart diagnostic suite built into the standard product. 
The standard fork is stainless steel, but there are different options. You could get a coated fork or a C276 alloy fork. We have pressure ranges up to ANSI 600 pounds, which is about 1,450 at room temp. And process temp ranges all the way up to 500 degrees F for 260C. The 2140 is also available with threaded, flanged, or tri-clamp connections with extensions up to four meters long. And that's about 157 inches long. <clears throat> the mean time between failure, or MTBF, is better than 30 years at standard operating conditions. And that's for the electronics. And the fork is better than 50 years at 180 degrees C. So again, we've designed this to be very robust and very reliable. All right, next I'm gonna turn it back over to Nicole and she will talk to you about the Rosemont 2140 for your most challenging applications and how to order those from TransCat. Uh, thank you. Um, so you guys can go to our website at any point in time, but better yet, um, so those are the, the items that we have on our website. Feel free to look for details there. But we do have a factory trained Rosemount specialist if you go to the next slide for me, Kevin. Thanks, Robin Gordon. Um, she's been trained at the factory and is fully focused on Rosemount products. So if you have any questions or need help um, configuring an item, please contact Robin directly and her contact information is there. So that's it for the webinar, but we are gonna open it up to the Q&A session right now. Um, and I want to remind you if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so in the right side of your webinar controls. And I'm going to I'm going to open up the questions and see what we've got here. Okay. All right. First question: How do you know the product is reliable if it's new? Don't you need runtime? Yeah, that's a great question, Nicole. Um, one of the ways we're able to uh, to prove that it's a reliable device is by utilizing existing technology that we've already had for several years, including decades of experience on. So as we mentioned in the presentation, the Rosemount pressure transmitter is the top part of this device, the blue can, if you will, at the top. And below the transmitter housing is based on existing 2100 analog device technology at the bottom. So we didn't really redesign anything new. This is a product that we brought together some of the digital infrastructure we have and coupled it with existing analog technology that we have. Last but not least, we did put this through a third party test and they went through and they get down to the component level on that third party test. What that means is they look at all the capacitors, resistors and electronic components that go under the board. And they look at the lifespan of the individual components, the amperages and the voltages that those components experience and they also look at how the device operates. And we can develop proven numbers and proven results on what appears to be a relatively new product. Okay, um, next question. How many wires does the 2140 require and do I need to pull new wires? That's another great question. We get this question a lot, Nicole. Um, this question is answered by this device is, is operational on a loop power setup. So similar to what you would wire a pressure transmitter or a temperature transmitter. The only catch that we want to be aware of is if you are replacing a float level switch and you have a float level switch that requires no power. Typically standard wiring is used on float level switches. Uh, because this is a digital instrument, we would want to use the same type of twisted shielded pair of 4 to 20 milliamp wires as you would use on any other pressure transmitter or temperature transmitter. Great question. Okay, next question. When the sensor is used for sand detection, how would the 4 to 20 milliamp signal respond? How would the control system know there was sand present if we only have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal? That's a great question. So when we have a condition where we have sand detection, 
uh, we can set up the either the frequency band. So for example, this nominally operates at 1400 hertz. We could have it set up so that when it encounters sand, it changes status. We present an alert to the system, the control system. The other thing is, is the digital on and off value of zero or one is also triggered once we have a certain frequency range encountered by the fork itself. So when I mentioned earlier, we're sort of ignoring the liquid level within a vessel. So for example, if we have 1400 hertz when the fork is dry, let's say now you dip it in oil, that'll drop down to about 1100 hertz. So normally that would take a normal switch and it would change it from dry to wet. In this instance here, we're going to ignore that drop in frequency, and we're gonna be looking for a frequency more consistent with sand or sediment detection, which is gonna be even lower than 1100 hertz. So with sand detection, you'll have four different settings, and you can adjust for different densities and different uh, compactness of the solids that you're going to experience at the bottom of a vessel. And you'll get those changes from dry to wet, and you can also set up discrete points. So for example, eight or 16 milliamps, or four or 20 milliamps, or whatever the user decides to use on their control system. So when we go from a wet, a dry condition to a wet sediment, sediment condition, we'll go from eight milliamps to 16 milliamps. Okay, the next question, I think you've answered it, but um, the next question is, is this for liquid only? This is, in terms of dry material, dry bulk solids, this is not designed for dry bulk solids. This is designed for liquid material or sediment at the bottom of a vessel underneath a liquid. So that's the only distinction there to make on that point. That point. Sure. Okay. Um, what is the liftoff voltage of the 2140? Great question. We designed the liftoff voltage to be as low as 12 volts, and that's actually posted in our specifications. But we've actually had it power up in laboratory settings down to as low as 8 volts and function flawlessly. So we've, we've put a margin of error in there, and we actually list the minimum voltage requirement as 12 volts DC. Okay. And do I need special software to use the 2140? Great question. So out of the box, you don't need special software. This device is set up to be 8 to 16 milliamps right out of the box, with 8 representing dry and 16 representing wet. And all the device configuration that I talked about in this presentation is above and beyond uh, straight out of the box. So if you wanted to configure it further, you certainly could. You could make adjustments to the specific gravity. You could do the media learn function. You could also do setup for the sand detection as well. But you certainly don't need to on a standard out of the product box. Um, in terms of doing <clears throat> the advanced configuration, yes, there is software and it's a free software. And all you do is go on emerson.com and download it. And you can go in there and configure this device however you need to for your process. So again, not required, but if you wanted to go in there and get uh, configure it to uh, the ultimate degree, you certainly could do that with the software. Okay, the same customer that asked if the product is for liquid only has also asked if we have a product like this for solids. Uh, we do not currently have a product like this for solids. It's in the works, but we currently don't have one right now. Now, we do have some folks that are taking advantage of the frequency of the vibration. And there are certain products that you could use this on, <clears throat> even though it's designed for liquid. We do have some customers that are putting this into solids and looking for that shift in frequency. So again, that would be trial and error, and that would be on the customer to go ahead and try that in their own setting. Uh, but again, this switch is designed, this uh, level detector is designed just for liquids at this time. All right, can it be configured via a heart communicator like your pressure transmitters? Yes, absolutely. We can configure it through the 375, the 475, or the new Trex heart communicator as well. Okay. Um, I don't have heart communication. Is there still a benefit to using the heart 2140? 
Yes, that's an, another excellent question. I get this question a lot because this device is digital. Uh, it is operating in the heart realm, but it also has the analog portion. And again, if you understand how heart works, it's overlaid on top of the analog signal. So that means that you always have your four to 20 milliamps and the heart digital signal is just seamlessly being communicated on top of those two wires. So what that means is if you had a 2140 set up to map the frequency to your four to 20 milliamps, I'll give you some numbers to help make that a little bit more clear. Imagine that you set up your dry condition to be 1400 Hertz and you make that 20 milliamps. And then you set up your wet condition of 900 Hertz and make that four milliamps. So now with this device, you can map your frequency to a four to 20 milliamp range set. And over time, the fork may corrode or more you may get coated or there may be damage to the fork physically. Those frequencies will change. So if you have coating, the actual frequency of vibration will start to drop over time. It'll slowly degrade. And if you have your four to 20 milliamp mapped to a frequency range, your four to your actually milliamp range will go down as well. Now on the flip side, if the fork started to corrode, that actually drives the fork frequency up. So depending on where your 20 milliamp range point is, you may go up to 20 milliamps, you may even go into saturation, which is a good indication to go out and check the fork itself. So again, you can get advanced diagnostics if you just monitor the milliamp range point of the device. So in standard conditions, it should operate around 1400 Hertz when it's dry. And let's just say you map that again to around 18 milliamps. You should expect your milliamp output to be 18 milliamps over time. If you start to drop down to 16, 15, or 14, or start going up to 19, 20, or going up into saturation, then you know you have a problem with your device. So again, this is all just talking about the analog signal with no digital inter intervention at all. Okay, some equipment will have vibrations. Um, let me see, some equipment will have vibration. Does that affect the frequency on the fork? Does that make sense? No, we get this question a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we get this question a lot because this device operates based on vibration frequency. Uh, we get the question, will that interfere with these devices here? Now, this device operates in a, in a pretty narrow band when it's dry. It's nominally 1400 hertz. And generally, equipment doesn't operate in that exact frequency band. So that's number one. And number two, we have all this advanced diagnostics where we're actually looking at not only the frequency, but the amplitude of that signal return coming back. So anything out of the ordinary will be caught by this device. And so a, for example, a vibrating piece of equipment that's vibrating this transmitter is gonna give an unknown signal back to the electronics at the top. And we're gonna be able to detect that if it gets out of hand. Generally speaking, we don't have a problem with this on any of our analog products or this new digital product as well. There's a very, very low incident rate of any vibration interacting with the fork switch itself. Okay. Uh, can this be used with freezing liquids? Yeah, you certainly could. On um, this device here, since we're monitoring the frequency, uh, for example, if you were to take this at 1400 hertz, and dip it in water, it may drop down to about 1200 hertz. And then when it freezes, you're gonna get even a slightly different frequency because the specific gravity is what this device is responding to. So ice is a little bit specific gravity different than water, different than oil, different than foam. And we could detect all those different devices, all those different process conditions just based on the frequency range. So again, if we were to freeze water around the forks, you'll see a different frequency band than if you were just to dip it in the water or oil. Okay. All right, that looks like it's our last question. Um, so if you have further questions that were not answered or you'd like to find out more about our product and service offering, you can contact us at 800-800-5001 on the web at transcat.com or you can email me directly at nvanword at transcat.com. You also have Robin Gordon's information that you will receive with the slides um, and the presentation that we'll send out in a few days.
thank you for joining us today and thank you, Kevin. Uh, we hope you got something out of the presentation and that you continue to join us for future TransCat eLearning webinars. Thanks everyone, have a great day.